Good evening. Please stand and worship with us.
love us because no matter what's going on in our lives when we look at that cross and we see it's empty we know that you loved us enough to die on that cross for us for our sins for our punishment for what we deserve lord and when we look at that grave we remember the hope we have in you we remember that what you did for us you gave us hope you gave us grace you gave us salvation lord so we know that you have an overwhelming never failing love for us and we come to glorify and worship and thank our loving Father and the loving Lord Jesus. Amen. Would you take a seat? Thank you guys. Hello church, welcome and welcome to everyone online with us. I was just doing a count of the band of who was on stage and I counted four of them. They were serving in the service this morning and again tonight. So thank you guys. That's dedication and the building blocks that we build our church and our community on. So we've got in May coming up our May Missions Month. So it's a, a highlight in our church each year to focus on our cross-cultural missions. So we're going to kick the month off on the 4th of May on a Saturday night with a Mission May Month dinner. So could I invite Leanne to come up and just tell us what the, the plan is? I think you're going to love it. So we're having this mission night, this um, dinner, and this morning in the congregation I was saying that when Jonathan was inducted at, at this church, we were Hornsby Baptist Church then, after the service we had this special lunch and it was a potluck lunch so everybody bought something and it was the most wonderful feast from different food from different cultures it was just a table laden with food and so we thought that this may mission month dinner we might try and do something similar to that we haven't had a potluck dinner for ages so we're inviting you to come along to this may mission dinner 6 30 to 8 8 30 there's no cost but come and bring something to share with everybody so it can be a cultural meal uh, it can be whatever you would like to bring. Please bring that to share. We're going to be providing uh, rice and salads and bread rolls. So anything you'd like to bring, bring that along. Um, also, it would be great if you could label it. So, you know, you might like something super hot and spicy, but we'll have some other people there that may not. So if you bring a meal, um, uh, please label it. 
And the other thing that I'm looking for is a team of people to help me with the clean-up. So I've already got one volunteer, thanks Trotty. Um, I, I would really love about six people to help with the clean-up at the end of the event. So it's not the, um, any of the setting up, but just the clean-up at the end. So if you're able to help on that night, please come and see me after. Thank you. God is painting his story on a canvas of generations in the colours of the nations. This April, we're looking at our core value, Canvas of Colour. I think there's a good chance you right now are sitting in church watching this video. If so, look around. I bet you'll see people of different backgrounds, ages, experiences, languages, gifts, and personalities. At Northern Life, we are a canvas of lots of different colours, but we are a canvas. One long, interconnected canvas of generations. Behind me is a literal canvas depicting the moment that the foundation stone of this church was laid on February 6, 1904. As a faith community, we have been meeting on this site for over 120 years. That's a lot of generations, and yet it's one long canvas, a canvas of faithful followers of Jesus passing on the wisdom of the gospel to the next generation and the next generation and the next, right up to today. And so today, the question for us is, how tight are the canvas seams between the generations of our church? How well are we passing on the wisdom of the gospel back and forth between the many generations of our church? I had a lecturer at college who would often ask, who's your Paul and who's your Timothy? What he means is, who are you learning from and who are you feeding into? Because as followers of Jesus, we all need both. If we are going to have tight seams in the canvas of generations in our church, we all have a part to play. God is painting his story on a canvas of generations in the colors of the nations. Northern life, let's keep the canvas going. Thanks, Ben. You're such a good teacher. I did forget to mention, if you plan to come to the May Missions Night, if you could just put your name on the list out at the Pathways desk, just so we can plan logistics. And if you're new in the church, we'd love to have you along. It's a great time to meet people, build relationships. It's a round table thing, so it's friendly um, in that way. So let's stand and read our scripture together. So if you're new here, we have a scripture for each month that we're teaching from. And there's something powerful about speaking the word out and reading it together. Let's read. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He is compassionate on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful peace will exalt you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might so that all people may know your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations. Well read. And the last note is next Sunday night we've got our dinner after the service and, um, and I challenge you, who can you invite along to it? So not just as a social thing, but it's probably something that's just an easy one to bring someone along who's not used to church. But just ask the Lord, who could you possibly invite? Take a minute and say hello to the people around you. Um, so tonight's Bible reading is from Mark chapter 4, starting from verse 21. 
He said to them, do you bring in a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on its stand? For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. Consider carefully what you hear, he continued. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and even more. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. He also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, because the harvest has come. Again, he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them, as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. Good evening. Chase, could you put up the May Missions Month dinner invite again? Please? What style is that artwork, do you reckon? What did you say? Like old. <laughs> old, come on, more, more. Norman Rockwell, who's heard of Norman Rockwell? Okay, a few. So Norman Rockwell, I did advertising as a, his training a long time ago. Norman Rockwell was this classic, probably 1950s advertising guru. And so I asked ChatGPT, give me a May Missions Month logo in a Norman Rockwell style with a whole bunch of people from different nationalities looking around a globe and around dinner. That was pretty cool, I thought. Just don't look at the weird hands and the weird... <laughs> We'd face it every now and then. But the point of it is to build a juxtaposition, that, that sort of speaks of 1950s mission. Like, it's awesome stuff. People getting called and churches sending out people around the world. What Mike's going to do is sort of flip that and make a point because he's got a real heart for people recognising you're sent now. We're all sent. You don't actually have to have this call to go overseas to be on mission. Amen. And that's what we're going to explore, and he'll open stuff up. He's got real expertise in that, in his own training and what he's done in leadership. And so, Mike, thank you so much for doing it, because you bring a real level of excellence that we're going to be thrilled to come under. And so, just so you know, that is a picture of mission, and God calls people and sends them around the world, and he does the same for people who stay right here. We're all on mission. So... Back to Mark. We're still in Mark. Let me pray. Lord God, uh, as we come under your word again, we pray for help. And uh, I pray that you would stir us as a congregation uh, by your spirit that we might find the truth we are looking for here. Uh, help me as I speak, but I really hope that together we could, uh, we could get some special revelation from you in Jesus' name. Amen. I think this group of parables is one of the uh, weightiest portions of Scripture you'll find. Which might sound, <clears throat> excuse me, a bit weird because it's just a bunch of uh, simple little parables. But what it opens up is um, a question, a statement that I'd like to begin with. And this is weighty. And the statement is this. The kingdom of God is manifest in hiddenness. The kingdom of God is manifest in hiddenness. The Gospel of Mark began in 1, 14 and 15 with Jesus saying, the kingdom, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. Mark's Gospel is all about the kingdom. What is our working definition of the kingdom of God? What's your definition before Chase puts it up there? 
What is the kingdom of God? Where, where God reigns and only he reigns. Yeah, where God reigns and only he reigns. The realm of God's eternal reign is one way you could describe it. We've got that there. And another one that uh, Dallas Willard put out there years ago, and is a really helpful one, is the range of God's effective will. The range of God's effective will, where what God wants to happen is happening. His kingdom is manifest in hiddenness. Before we get into it, I'm just going to open it up again. What does that even mean? What do you think? The kingdom of God is manifest in hiddenness. No wrong answers. Yeah. Sure, yeah, yeah. Anyone else? Who's first? To live? Yeah, to live and walk in the kingdom of God is to have a place of things that we've set out on the side, but if we do them in our life, that starts to manifest a new nature in the kingdom of God. Yeah, okay. So manifest, what does that mean? Yeah, have visible form. It's, it's something that's sort of evident. You know, you can see it. So I think we are talking about, in a in general sense, the idea that God is at work behind the scenes. He's at work in ways that often we miss. Just think about the life of Jesus. The life and ministry and death and resurrection of Jesus. God in human flesh. What do you reckon? Manifest in hiddenness, wouldn't you say? Like, no one got it. You could say the women were pretty close to it at the end there, but like, would you, is that fair to say? Because I really want to explore this. So I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to just if you, have you sit there and expect me that I'm saying the right things. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of looking for some feedback. Don't you think, honestly, the life of Jesus is an example of the kingdom of God revealed? In hiddenness. I mean, people just didn't get it. He grabbed 12 people that lived with him 24 7 and they didn't get it. They didn't just say, We're with you till the end, no worries, Lord. They were all really scared at his uh, arrest. And it wasn't until after when they received the Spirit at Pentecost. But even then, I would still argue, I reckon there's a lot of boldness, but a lot of hiddenness in the revealing of the kingdom post-Pentecost. So, before we get to the passage, I want you to grab your Bibles or just watch along here and try to concentrate. Um, it's only 5.30 on a Sunday night. We're not, uh, it's not deep into the night. But I'm, again, I'm asking you to help, to, to be part of this and think about these passages. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 25. We're, we're trying to understand from Scripture, is the kingdom of God manifest in hiddenness? 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 25, Paul's writing to the church at Corinth, and he says in verse 22, Jews demand signs, like they, they want to see the Red Sea open up. You know, they, They're looking for power. Jews d- demand signs. Greeks, like the goddess Athena, they're looking for wisdom. But he says, but we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. Christ, the power of God, the Jews are looking for power. They don't think the most powerful thing you could possibly do is die on a cross for the sin of the world. But that's what Christ has done. And dying on a cross seems pretty dumb, pretty foolish for the Greeks. But Paul is saying, no, it's elite wisdom. What looks weak, what looks dumb is neither with the kingdom of God and God at work. And then you have 2 Corinthians 1 as another example of this hidden kingdom manifest in strange ways. 
2 Corinthians 1, writing back to the church at Corinth, Paul says, I've had some stuff happen to me that's been confusing. I have got to the point, this is post-Pentecost. He's filled with the Spirit of God. And he's like, I got to the point where I despaired of life itself. Like, honestly, that's saying, I sort of thought, can I even go on? Do I even take my own life? Like, he, he, he can barely cope. But he says, but... I was given comfort in the midst of my despair. In verse 10, he has delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope and he will continue to deliver us. In weakness, God is at work. The kingdom of God is manifest in hiddenness, not just in victory. And then you have back in the Gospels, in a different Gospel, the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, 6, 7 of Matthew. And Jesus is about to give the the most um, in-depth unveiling of truth really jam-packed into a couple of chapters we probably find in the whole of the Bible. And it begins with the Beatitudes saying, blessed are, and what does blessed mean? More than happy is. More than happy are the poor in spirit. This is when he's unveiling all the truth. The manifesting of What is correct? Blessed, more than happy are those who mourn. Blessed are happy are the meek. More than happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's odd, don't you think? Who gets the title of blessed? The kingdom of God is manifest in hiddenness. Because if you get to know the king of the kingdom, you are blessed in ways that are hidden. And then you know, all we have to do is think about our one, a memory verse a few months ago, Philippians 2, where it says that Jesus, out of humility, went to the cross, died in our place. And because of that act of humility and obedience, he's been given a promotion, given the name above every other name, every power in heaven and on earth and under the earth will kneel before him. He is Lord to the glory of God. Through suffering on a cross, he went to the highest place. The kingdom of God is manifest in hiddenness, isn't it? I'm losing people as I look around. Too many scriptures, eh? Is that fair? Am I making an argument that's fair? Hebrews 11.6, without faith, you can't please God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hiddenness, faith is believing that God's at work, even though we're not quite seeing it the way we'd hope. And then now we come to Mark. Parable one, number one. There's four parables here. Parable number one. Uh, chapter four begins with Jesus on a boat. He's getting a natural amphitheater. He's just a little bit out. The water is resonating his voice, and he's speaking to a large crowd. And he says to them, do you bring a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on its stand? For whatever's hidden is meant to be disclosed and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. What does that mean? What is he saying? What is he basically saying in that short parable? Please give me the answer if you've got it. It's very different to having sermons where you're forced to think and respond, isn't it? Much easier being passive. If you know the truth, you're not going to put it and hide it away. Yeah. You're going to bring it out so that everyone can know where it's from. The light has come into the light and the darkness extinguished. Yeah. Isn't that the answer? I don't think it's anything more than that. Like, revelation is meant to be understood. God is the source of all light. And Jesus starts and he's starting teaching some parables. He's just taught a very significant parable, which we looked at this morning, the parable of the sower, which may be the most important story ever told on earth about how people hear truth, listen. We looked this morning at the Shema, the Holy Prayer of Israel. It begins with, hear Israel. Hear Israel, Shema Israel. 
And then in the sermon, um, the sower, Jesus in verse 3, at the very beginning of the great uh, parable of the sower, he says, listen, a farmer sowed seed. This whole section is about listening, hearing God's truth and receiving it with a receptive heart. But like, I actually think it's exactly that. Revelation is meant to be understood. Light will do its job. So can we move on? I think that's parable one. It's like if you've got a lamp, you don't put it under a rock. Like you, you, <laughs> you let the, the lamp show light and revelation. So we're like, okay, Lord, there's revelation to be received. That's a good thing. Parable two, he says, consider carefully what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And even more, whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. What does that mean? Yeah. Yes. What's the general gist of the parable? If you just had to say, what's the main thing he is saying? It seems too simple, but it's, it's the truth. What you receive will expand and you'll be given more. Like there's revelation going out all the time from God. Psalm 19. The heavens declare his glory. There's truth. God's in human flesh standing there talking to people. He's just talked about different soils in people's hearts. And it's all about how good are your ears? Are you listening? And so he says, there's revelation available. You don't hide it under a rock. And by the way, if you receive it with a good heart, with good soil, you're teachable and humble, you're going to learn more and more and more. And you'll be used by God more and more and more. But if you shut yourself off, if you have a closed heart, it's only going to get darker. Isn't that what he's saying? Whoever has is going to be given more. And he's talking about the truth of revelation. And we're trying to understand this in the light of the kingdom of God is manifest in hiddenness. So sometimes if you don't receive the truth that God is giving you, it will, be, it will remain more and more hidden. But there's something beautiful that happens when you receive revelation and you allow the Spirit to teach you more and more. You have eyes to see and ears to hear when He's at work in ways that other people miss. Amen? This is kingdom truth. Parable 3. He also said, this is what the kingdom of God's like. A man scatters seed on the ground night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up. The seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk and then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, because the harvest has come. What does that one mean? We will reap what we sow. Okay. Yeah. Is it in line with what we've been saying? The kingdom of God is manifest in hiddenness. Like 
don't get overcomplicated. What is the seed in the ground doing? Stuff that you can't see. <laughs> it's growing. I think also uh, building on to that God does, all, does the work to make sure it seeds grow. You are the one who has to put the seed in the first place and trust God. Okay. Yeah, good. The kingdom grows in hiddenness, but also in an ordered fashion. Seed. Seed sprout, seed grows, first stalk, then head, then full kernel, then harvested. And, you know, I think we could, many of us could relate to the idea of humility, revelation granted to us, obedience, repentance, obedience some more, blessing. Would you agree that God is often at work a lot slower than we hope he is. This idea of a seed growing slowly. And there's lots of examples in life that we, we, we know about. If you're trying to get fit, it takes time. If you're building a relationship between human beings, it just takes time to build those connections. If a child is learning how to swim, you don't see much happening for a long time, but it's all happening underneath and they're learning... That's what the kingdom of God is like, a seed growing underground. The kingdom of God is manifest in hiddenness. Lots of stuff that God does in our lives, he's doing it without us knowing. And we don't understand what's going on. That's what the passage says, isn't it? The farmer doesn't quite understand what's going on, but he trusts. Yeah, you sow the seed, water it in the soil, and God's doing a work. Parable 4. Again, he said, What shall we say the kingdom of God is like, or what parable shall we use to describe it? And then I find this fascinating. This is the, the, the word of God. This is Jesus. You know, God incarnate. He's watched all of human history, all of life itself. He could come up with anything he wants. Yes? He's about to choose to pick a metaphor, a picture, a parable that describes what the kingdom of God is like. Anything at all. And he says, I know, I know. It's like a mustard seed, the kingdom of God. It's the smallest of all seeds on earth. And us in the 21st century go, I love that, Lord. Because sometimes I feel like I've got little faith. Like, I've got tiny faith, but you're telling me the kingdom of God is like that. People who just, you know, they bring their brokenness and they're just a little bit of faith, but God sees it and he does a work. And, and look, that's the truth. He's saying something about the smallness of the faith required. But then he says, where it heads, he says, when, when it's planted, verse 32, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable, but when he was alone with his disciples, he explained everything. When I was growing up, I used to just imagine, oh, mustard trees must be so awesome. Like, I've never seen one, but like, you know, <laughs> I can, you know, I've seen massive gum trees or huge red cedars. Must, mustard, I've, I've never seen a mustard, but it must be bigger than that, right? Because he can do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. God can do anything. Mary was told, with man this is impossible, with God it's possible. Like, dream, like, you know, God can do anything. That's certainly what I thought was the mustard tree. This is the mustard tree. Grows about 10, 12 feet high. Mike's an agriculture guy and he looked it up at our Bible study and he said, they grow very quickly. So that might be some of the takeaway that Jesus was saying. Are you blown away? Are you blown away? This is it. This is our Lord. He's the most creative being in the universe. He knows everything. And he's creative, does a great job of coming up with symbols. Communion, baptism. Here's his moment to shine, to just to put it out there. 
And we would look back and go, wow, the kingdom of God is manifest in hiddenness. He says, it's like, it's like a mustard seed. It takes a long time to grow. And then when it grows, oh, she's a beauty, isn't she? Give me your feedback. What are you thinking? Did you all know that's what a mustard tree looks like? Lovely, yeah. Cool tree, great tree. Yeah. Anything? What are you picking up from these four parables? Maybe we overcomplicate things. Have you ever thought about you know, when, when Jesus was doing his life and ministry, he went up on that mountain and he was transfigured in glorious, shining, you know, revelation, glory. How many people did he give it to? Three. Matthew, um, Peter, James and John. When he was resurrected from the dead, it, it, truly glorious, glorious. He didn't do the transfiguration again. I would have thought that he would have gone, okay, guys, here we go. There's 500 of you. Let me show you. I never showed you this. I I was self-limited, but here we go. Boom. The transfiguration stuff. I'm not not being disrespectful, honestly. You only get that in Revelation. And even in Revelation, he's got blood coming out of him. My point is, The kingdom of God is manifest in hiddenness. Even the Lord Jesus, his life and death and resurrection, clearly there was hiddenness there. People didn't understand what was going on, what God was doing for the universe through him. But you think that when it's all finished, he would go, ta-da, it's all here, the big red cedars of Lebanon. No, no, he looked more like a mustard tree. They thought he was the gardener. And then he sent, he he went back to heaven, disappeared into a cloud, gave his spirit to his church, and they had boldness for a while, for sure. But they got stuff wrong. And... Before we came in, there was a song being played, Oh, What a Beautiful Life. Oh, what a beautiful life, what a beautiful life. And I thought, isn't it cool to be living in a time in history when you just sing that song? Because a lot of people who have lived and called, called Jesus Christ their Lord, that was more of a hidden truth. Do you know what I'm saying? That was a hidden truth for people that lost their lives. In, in the first century, when Jesus said, <clears throat> I send you out as lambs among wolves. I think he was dr- describing a mustard tree. Now, you might be sort of thinking, where are you going? This is so depressing. I just want to point out that Gandalf came back at the end of the Lord of the Rings on a white horse, didn't he? Jesus comes at a white horse in the end in Revelation, I think. But he's, certainly, he's certainly glorious. But the, the life we have been called to live is gloriously understated. It is. Maybe this, this is why we read truth bombs like this in James. James 1.4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature. That is teleos, that is perfect, that is lacking nothing, and complete, not lacking anything. This process of getting the truth that's in the revelation of the lamp, that isn't hidden, but it's found 
in strange places, trials, sufferings, glories, the hiddenness of human frailty. Like a truth bomb in Romans chapter 5, verse 3, not only so, we glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. I find it, I just find it challenging. We did this, looked at this stuff in Bible study this week. And, um, and when I put this forward, I feel like a faithless person. I feel like I'm undermining the glories of Christianity. But I, I still look at these, these parables and I, and I look at the life of Christ and I, the, the church and I think it's more hidden than you think. We, we could talk about glorious uh, Christian mission, couldn't we? Reaching China, church growing, big churches in America, in Africa, in South America, like that. All the great stuff that God has done. And, you know, he does. He does bless. But like the Proverbs, not everything is true all the time. I'm suggesting you tonight that the typical expectation of the kingdom that we should expect is hidden, less powerful than more powerful. Think of the evangelicals of America. Are they looking far better now that they have access to more power? They're not. Christians all over America are saying, well, I can't call myself an evangelical anymore because that's been loaded with a whole lot of stuff that I'm not. And a lot of that stuff is about power. Is that fair to say? I'm not trying to bash on any, any particular wing, but Christianity, when it gets more and more powerful, normally gets more and more further away from who she is meant to be. Because of this truth, the kingdom of God is manifest in hiddenness. It looks like a mustard tree, but it's a glorious mustard tree. So I got to the end of this prep of this sermon and I was like, oh, Lord. Okay, let's go out and be mustard trees. And what are we saying? Are we saying that this is... Uh, Pretty less than what we hope for. But that's not it at all. Because the answer is found in Philippians. Where Paul writes about the kingdom of God. In chapter 4 he says, Rejoice in the Lord always, I'll say it again, rejoice. Rejoice, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. There's a work going on that is hidden in us, isn't it? Like we are hidden in Christ. The kingdom of God is manifest in hiddenness. It's what is happening in here that matters. And of course, there will be good that comes from that. But when Paul writes a little bit further on in chapter 4, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Others might look at my life and say, Paul, you had so much potential. You just ended up a mustard tree. And he's like, oh, yeah, but I'm a mustard tree who knows God. And that's what he says. He says, I've learned to be content. I know what it is to be. It's funny, I don't know why this has got me so emotional. Probably because it's close to the truth, I think. Um, he says, I've learned the secret of being content. Which is a big secret, isn't it? That's a hiddenness of the kingdom. Other people would look at Paul and think, well, there's no way you could have joy. There's no way you could have peace. 
because you're, you know, the list of the, the ways he's been treated. He's had terrible things. He's nearly drowned, beaten, this, flogged, that. He said, no, but I've found the way to find the, the king of the kingdom in the midst of all that. I've found him. And that's the secret, right? That's the secret of Philippians 3. Whatever was what I sought after in the past in Philippians 3, he says, I don't consider that of any worth at all, but what I really think is worthwhile is what? Knowing Christ. And I think what Paul is saying in that passage is, I learnt how to make God the end in himself and not a means to my end. He's not the one I go to to get blessed. He's the one I go to to know, just to know. He's like, he says, I long to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, the glorious stuff, along with that, the power of the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful stuff? That that's what it's all about, this Christian life. Knowing Christ. Knowing Christ Jesus. And if you haven't worked it out, that's a profound graduate Christianity journey. Amen? It's not just another Bible study. It's to find a peace that transcends what's going on in my life. And out of that peace of knowing Christ, there is this joy. And there's an ability to love others. And I get my eyes off what I'm trying to establish because I'm so convinced that I'm meant to have a red cedar to the glory of God that is my ministry or my job or whatever. I think that's what Jesus is saying. It looks like a mustard tree. It's not bad, but it's, it doesn't look... The world's going to look at you and go, huh, power? Isn't that what Paul said at the start of this? Power and wisdom, that's found in someone who recognises that knowing Christ is the end we seek. Amen? Knowing Christ himself is the secret. The kingdom of God is manifest in hiddenness. We talked about this at our Life Hub, as I said. And one of our members said something so great at the end. Um, she said, my identity in Christ is hidden. That's what matters. And that's how no, nothing can touch me. Because I am in Christ. The kingdom of God is manifest in hiddenness. I am in the kingdom. I belong to the king. I am in Christ, but you wouldn't know it from looking at me because it's all in here and here. Amen? I am in Christ. I am hidden in him. And what he does through me might look hidden to the rest of the world, but I know he's at work because he's planted a seed in me. That's where I finish. Anyone got anything good to add? I really mean it. I was just thinking about Psalm 143 where it talks about that the power of the tongue is in your hand. Yeah. Mm. That's cool. What has the Spirit of God given us tonight as we come under these parables? The kingdom of God is manifest in hiddenness. What, 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 if, what, what have you got that you could share with us? Jack, I want to put you on the spot. I, we, we, you accepted the title of resident theologian. <laughs>
Yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, Jesus is the most, like, the, the glory of who he is is so hidden by his circumstances. And I think if we're called to follow him, we should expect a similar hiddenness, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. See, we can buy into this idea that's just before these four parables, that blessings of 30, 60, 100 fold. I think there's this incredible truth that when, when you find your satisfaction in Christ alone, he gives you the peace that follows. And then sometimes he just gives you a hundredfold blessing. Like sometimes he just gives you some crazy blessing. But when you chase the blessing, he's probably going to teach you that he's the one you want to be seeking. Any other thoughts? It's a genuine, genuine hope that the Spirit of God would speak in someone that no one expects to speak it. (laughs) To share it. Honestly, I'm just like, I should love to hear if you're sitting there going, you know what, I've got this angle that. Consider carefully, consider carefully what you listen to. Sure. So I think in, in that sense, the, the, you know, if, if everything is in the scriptures is the very word of God, then we're going to carefully hear or embrace it. Mm. And, and that's kind of the, the way I go about it, is to, to be able to embrace it and to listen and to hear. Good stuff. When you know Christ, he's with you with whatever you're engaging with, and sometimes he wouldn't be comfortable with some of the things we engage with. And that we, yeah. knowing him grows out of that, doesn't it? I always have the thought about it, that basically the, the vision of God's soul is, is basically the next step in life. And what sort of experiences you take with him is what you know, that next step is going to be like more and it, the more consistent you talk to God, the closer you're going to get. Okay, yeah. Trotty, were you about to say something? Amen. I was just thinking about the uh, mustard seed that maybe you chose it because it was so small. It's like it's hidden. It's hard to see. Mm. Yeah, hard to see it even at the start. It was interesting as you were comparing what the mustard tree looked like to what you thought a grand tree would look like. So the success of the world is different to the success of the kingdom. Yeah. And I like the scripture you gave earlier in James 1, James 1, 2 to 4, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, is that be happy when there's hardship going on because it's asking the question, God, what are you doing in my life? And then it goes on in verse 4 saying, have its perfect result so you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So in God's kingdom, the mustard tree's perfect. And it might not be the measure of the success of the world, 
but it's a promise of his. Of That's what he's developing in us. And whether you consider yourself hopeless or a nobody or broken, that's his promise. I will perfect in you wherever you are in your life. Amen. Mike, do you mind um, just offering to pray? Anybody just want to raise their hand, not go into any detail, but um, if you're struggling right now as we think about it in uh, the hiddenness of the kingdom, uh, God being at work but seems pretty slow, not working out the way that you expect or hope, um, not asking you to share anything, but um, uh, Mike's got a real heart for praying for breakthrough like that. So, oh, this, okay, is there someone here, Trotty? Mike, do you want to stand and just lead us in prayer? Is this anyone else? I'm just, my question is waiting for the kingdom of God, that is God's goodness in our lives, his plan to come to pass, but it seems pretty hidden. But it's tough, it's tough sometimes when it's really hidden for long periods of time. Anyone else? Okay, there's people here. And it's for hardships now, disappointments of many years ago and all those things of just praying for God to work out his perfecting in your character, in your heart, fulfilling those promises. Anyone else? I know I saw your hand, Carly. Okay, so there's, there's lots of people. So could we pray? Just let your hands go down, that's okay. Thanks, mate. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness in our lives. When we acknowledge you and when we don't acknowledge you, when we're feeling close to you and when we're feeling distance, when we're feeling discouraged or when we're feeling not of the world, just want to acknowledge and thank you for your faithfulness and that's your heart, your personality and your character of just working in our lives and our circumstances. And to the world, we might not seem great success, but in your kingdom, we are so precious and valuable. You knitted us together in our mother's wombs and we face challenges today. We face disappointments of many years ago. For some of us, it might be depression or mental health issues. Others, it might be relationships. Others, it could be financial challenges. But Father, I thank you and acknowledge that your hand is upon every one of us and your hand is upon every one of our circumstances. And all you ask is us to keep coming back and saying, God, thank you. Thank you, Lord. And I'm going to take these circumstances and treat it as joy because I know you will work in those circumstances. And Lord, we want to declare that over every one of us here tonight, whether the hand was put up or not, we all face challenges. Some we're coping with better than others. But Lord, I pray and just give you the authority and the invitation to work your perfect will out in our lives. Your promise is that you will turn all things for good for those who love you. And Lord, the circumstances that are in our mind now as we're praying, that you will turn that for good and you'll take our weakness and you'll make it your strength. And Lord, we pray for success in your hidden kingdom over these challenges that we carry. And Lord, raise up within us a sense of hope of how you are taking our brokenness and our hopelessness and you're turning that into strength and success. And some of that will be in the seen and some of it will be in the unseen. But Lord, I thank you. That is your heart and your character. And it is for every one of us. There is no one excluded. There is no one outside this prayer. And Lord, I pray for this kingdom upon our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. going to have a time of response and worship so um, you can kneel or sit or stand but we're going to worship Lord Jesus with our bodies and our mouths you're turning over to 
tables and calling for return to our lives upon the altar the things we did at first you're clearing out the temple you're cleaning out the dirt for we are your territory lord we are your church
I'll see your scars, your open arms, the beauty of your face. In the tears of joy, I'll lift my voice in everlasting praise.
would you receive this blessing as I pray. May the Lord, the God who gives endurance and encouragement, give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Have a great week. Thank you.